ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome, friends, brothers, B'nai Noah, all the Noahites out there uh, who are joining us. Uh, again, uh, first of all, hope that you're all, those of you who might have suffered from the, uh, the terrible storms, uh, have managed to weather them, part, no pun intended, and are all safe with your families. Um, we're studying from the book, uh, I hope it doesn't come out backwards, uh, Brit Shalom, which means the covenant of peace. Uh, Brit, you might have heard of Brit, is also a the ceremony of circumcision, that Abraham is commanded to circumcise all the male members of his household many thousands of years ago. And it's a, it was a covenant. It was the covenant of the circumcision. But for short, when somebody's talking about they're going to a Brit Milah or a Bris, they're going to a ceremony uh, after a healthy child has been born, male child, uh, they bring in an expert or a physician that knows how to do it, and he performs the act of circumcision. And it's considered being uh, bringing in the child to the covenant of Abraham. Um, Brit means a covenant, though. So the covenant, Brit Shalom, I'm sure you all know the meaning of the word Shalom, is the, Brit, is the covenant of peace, um, which uh, the rabbi, Rabbi Sherki, who is the author of this book and is our leader of our organization here in Jerusalem, uh, the World Noahide uh, um, uh, Center, uh, is basically, he's the author of this book, and he decided that the idea of Noahides is not to have separate, uh, not cults, but not separate, uh, obviously groups, yes, you're going to have communities around the world um, and around the United States that are trying to follow the Noahide path, which is what we're discussing, but the idea is it will create, hopefully, a world harmony, a world peace, uh, well, we know the vision of the Messiah, whoever he's going to be, uh, when, he, when he appears, uh, is going to make world peace, to bring about world peace. But we believe that we should start working towards it. Uh, the United Nations, well, whether you believe in it, it's doing some good, I guess, costs a lot of money. And I think the American taxpayers foot the, a lot of the bill of the United Nations. Um, but the idea of a Brit Shalom, is the reason the rabbi called, named his book, which and lays out the laws, the uh, the basic laws of for Noahides and basically for all mankind is basically to create one universal religion that will be um, the the ceremonies might differ, but the principles are the seven, and um, the seven are belief in one God and not practice any form of idolatry. No, uh, murder, of course, is forbidden. Larceny, theft is forbidden. Um, suffering, causing the suffering of animals or the respecting animals' rights. And again, the question is how extensive should they be? Um, uh, the idea of, um, uh, against um, adultery and uh, pro is prohibited. And of course, incest, uh, I think I might've missed out. No, not necessarily. And the final one is to, try, is to set up, and this is for a society, to set up a system, a, judici a judicial system, a system where people can expect to get uh, an equal justice, justice for all, which was, again, of course, today in Western democracies, of course, that's what we expect. Uh, we go back, of course, hundreds of years, thousands of years. No, the average fellow, the poor bloke, like probably each one of us, wouldn't have expected justice uh, from, uh, the, from the, the ruling uh, class or from the wealthier or from the, uh, the, the more powerful and even from the gods. They didn't expect justice. You just put up with whatever you got and, and hoped for the best. Um, but of course, the Torah came 3,500 years ago, approximately onto the scene. God commanded, there's one law uh, and one justice for all, no matter who you are. Everybody deserves justice. It's hard, it's easy to say, hard to implement, but thank God we live in countries where yes, we do expect it. We don't always get it, but we expect it. Um, even a hundred years ago, there were countries, westernized countries in Western Europe, we'll call them cultured and civilized and educated, where again, land owning uh, gentlemen could get justice in a court and the poor peasant, the poor sodomy schnook like us, you know, you try to stay away from courts because you knew you'd only get into more trouble. So Brit Shalom means we're going to create, we're trying to create one universal um, uh, um, sort of way of doing things. It doesn't mean that one, we don't expect everybody to listen to one rabbi or a council of rabbis. We expect people, good-minded people, to base what they're doing on these principles. Uh, the seven that I mentioned before, which are considered the seven Noahide, um, seven Noahide um, 
uh, principles or commandments or mitzvot, as we call them. The fifth one, as Rabbi Sherki has, uh, when he wrote his book, composed his book, he put the fifth one as preservation of human life, which is the positive side of the coin, which is the, the prohibition, which would be the negative side, the prohibition of bloodshed, of spilling blood for no good reason. And uh, what is a good reason? The only reason to spill blood is in defense, is to protect you, yourself, your family, or others. Um, there's a criminal, a terrorist, a murderer. You're allowed to, if necessary, take that murderer's life in order to preserve other life. Uh, the Torah also says, and this is a question that I think uh, we'll deal with in this chapter, is what happens if you want to protect your property and somebody is threatening your property? Well, the Torah already dealt with that, and we'll get into that, that if you assume that somebody will raise arms against you, if you protect your property, in other words, somebody comes into your house and wants to rob you, and you say, excuse me, I'm, and you show them you have a weapon, and this person uh, refuses to accept it, you're allowed to stop this person um, bodily, physically, from stealing you. You're allowed to protect your property. If the last recourse was through using force, even deathly force. We, on the other hand, Judaism respects and values all human lives. Human life is precious. Every human being was created in the image of God, is a small miniature God. Um, and therefore, it must be precious, must be placed in value. And this, again, was a revolutionary idea in uh, when the Torah was given at Sinai, that life is precious because all human beings were created in the image of God. We're all God's children. So therefore, um, nobody's life is more valuable than others. We might uh, place, uh, you know, like women and children first in the lifeboats. Or, um, you know, we might uh, lay down our lives to save a bunch of children or our own children. God forbid we should ever be in a situation like that. And of course, uh, people who serve in the military have accepted that they are risking their lives and people in the security forces uh, sometimes are asked to uh, the hopefully only hypothetical situation. They might look to be asked to be to place their lives at, at peril in order to save other human beings. So now let's get into it. Let me put this on the screen. Uh, please feel free to ask questions or write any comments now or, or later on um, when it when it's uh, posted on the uh, on the uh, on the Facebook page on the YouTube uh, channel. All right, let me find this. We're going into as I said. Okay, now we've got to get to page thirty-one in this on uh, this book. Uh, how do I get there fast? Anyway, up here, oh, I just have to scroll down. Ah, oh, page number thirty-three already. What is this? Okay, here we are. Okay, so this is where we are. Uh, Frank, uh, it's on the screen. Give me a thumbs up. Frank, you can see what I've shared? Okay, great. So preservation of human life, prohibition of bloodshed. Uh, of course, in the book of Exodus and repeated again in the book of Deuteronomy, we have the 10 commandments. The 10 commandments, uh, some of you might know there is another name for the 10 commandments. Um, let me share uh, this. Uh, there's another name for the 10 commandments called the Decalogue. So most people know these few verses, chapter 20 in the book of Exodus. Uh, most of them know it as know them as the Ten Commandments. In the Jewish tradition, they're not Ten Commandments. In Jewish tradition, yes, you might find rabbis and other people in Jewish literature, in English and other languages, they might refer to them as the Ten Commandments because that's what everybody knows them as. And that was basically a, uh, a, a Christian um, translation of the, or they named it the Ten Commandments. In Hebrew, they're known as the 10 utterances, the 10 speeches. It's words, words that God spoke to the people of Israel who had just gotten out of Egypt, out of slavery, um, 50 days before that. They were standing at the foot of Sinai, somewhere in the southern part of, of Israel, well, outside the promised land. But in order, the, the Hebrew name would be translated more as the Decalogue. Uh, you know, like monologue, dialogue means something has something to do with speech. Deca from the word 10, Latin word or Greek word of 10. So the Decalogue means the 10 utterances. Uh, according to Jewish tradition, these were uttered in 10 uh, utterances to the people of Israel, to the, the Bnei Yisrael. Now, why do we, why am I pointing out the, that uh, really the name 10 commandments is a misnomer? 
it's a, it, it was badly named because according to Jewish tradition, there are more than 10 commandments here. There are about 13 or 14. Let me give you an example. Look at verse three. Verse three is part of the second commandment, right? You shall, have no, you shall not have um, any other gods or gods of others. This is a strange translation. Have any other gods in my presence? So that's already one commandment, right? You can't have other gods. Now, in the same commandment in brackets, it says you shall not make for yourself a graven image or any likeness, which is in the heavens above or on the earth below. Uh, you shall not bow down to them or worship them. These are each one of these are separate commandments. It's all part of the same theme of idolatry or paganism, but there are three or four commandments just in the second one. So that would already bring us up not to 10 commandments, but maybe to 13 or 14. And then I would take you to, let's say, the Sabbath. Go down to verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to sanctify it. All right, that seems to be the commandment of Sabbath. Six days you can work and perform all your labor. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to Hashem, to God. You shall perform no labor. So wait a second. That's already another commandment. Again, in the theme of the Sabbath, of honoring and respecting and, and sanctifying the Sabbath, the Sabbath day. But this is these are two separate commandments in the same uh, in the same uh, theme. So therefore, when the rabbis of old, when they counted up how many commandments do you have from verse one, from the beginning of the chapter all the way to number fourteen, to chapter fourteen, to verse fourteen, you have about thirteen or fourteen commandments, mitzvot or mitzvahs. So therefore, just an interesting point. We call them the Decalogue, but not to get too complicated, yeah, we also refer to them as the ten. But it really, it means the ten utterances. At least that's what they should be. Now, why did I bring this? Because after the fifth one, as we usually count it, the fifth dibra, the fifth utterance, which is, we've discussed it, honoring your parents, your mother, and your father and your mother. The next one, number six, is you shall not murder. Lo, I put the Hebrew too, if any of you can read the Hebrew, lo tirzach. Now, you shall not murder. What would be a, a, a similar word, a synonym to the word murder? In English, it would be, you shall not kill. In Hebrew also, there's another word that's very similar to retzach, which is murder. There's something called uh, laharog, a verb, which means to kill. So parallel to the English. Now, is there a difference between murder and killing? I would propose, and Jewish tradition says, yes, of course there is. Um, a soldier, if he kills the enemy, and we should, God, we all pray for peace, world peace. But if a soldier is defending his country, um, and he shoots and kills the enemy soldier in battle, he has not murdered; he has killed. So, therefore, the Torah was was uh, distinct, and the Torah said, killing is sometimes permitted. It's unfortunate but it is sometimes permitted. When it's permitted, it is not murder. It's you've killed, that's the action, that's the deed, but it isn't murder for a soldier in battle, for a policeman or an anti-terror squad that have no other choice but to put down the, 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 the potential murder or the, the mass murder or the terrorist, they are killing. And actually we see them doing a good thing. It's not happy, not happy about it, we should be sad when another human being has to be put down. Well, that's not a nice term, but has to be killed. But it is permitted. The problem is in non-Jewish translations, you generally will find it doesn't, the commandment is not written as you shall not murder. It says you shall not kill, which is why in the United States and some other Christian countries, you have conscientious objectors. In World War II, probably in World War I, and other times when there was a conscription, when there was a draft. Now, I'm not looking to judge anyone, but it, based on what could they claim that they should be exempt from serving in the military, because the, the Bible says you shall not kill if they were believers. So if it says you shall not kill, and they're a believing Christian and a practicing Christian, well, then the Bible says you can't kill. Um, but... Uh, in, the Jew, in, in Israel, nobody will use the Bible, and there are some conscientious objectives here. There is conscription here, every able-bodied uh, male and female, unless they opt out and said they are so religious that they don't serve in the Israeli army, and then 
we would like to, we'd expect them to uh, do some kind of national service. I can give you an example. Um, my daughters, I'm blessed with two daughters, four boys and two daughters. My two daughters opted out of serving in the military. Instead of that, they uh, served. They served two years in some kind of national service plan, either working with underprivileged, underprivileged youth um, or, uh, or you know, things like that. Some of them work as nurses. Um, there are jobs for, the, for women in the Israeli army, and there are important jobs, important roles, generally not combat. It's a, de it's a debate here in Israel whether um, they, women should be allowed in all combat units. There are um, actually female pilots, fighter pilots that will go into combat, uh, you know, piloting a plane, there are that, but, th but that's something else. But most religious girls, girls that don't want to be amongst, um, listen, I can, I can tell you that when I served in a base all the way down in Sinai before the accord with Egypt, and I was on an armored base, tanks, and let's say about 30 to 40 tanks on the base, which meant about, plus the support um, units, then we had, let's say about four to 500 males on a base far away from home and from any other city. And you had 400 male soldiers and you had about 20 female soldiers. I wouldn't want my daughter or my sister to be in a situation where she has separate quarters, the men are, it's off limits for males, but they're still quite outnumbered and, uh, and it's just not always comfortable. So doing national service, helping the country in hospitals, volunteering, uh, to be social workers and so on is also very important for the fabric and for the long-term security. But let's go back to it. There are uh, humanist uh, Israelis who opt out. They say they believe in pacifism. It doesn't, when, when you're being threatened with annihilation by countries like Iran and terrorist organizations like Hamas and Hezbollah, most Israelis feel, what? You're not going to defend yourself? You know, most of us think these people are off their off their rockers, but the law does allow it. They, they would have to prove it in court. But uh, what I wanted to emphasize, they're not, nobody will claim I'm doing it because the Bible permits, per, forbids me to, to, to carry an arm, to carry arms or to raise arms or to hurt someone else. Because the Bible in Hebrew doesn't say that. It says you shall not murder. And it was a mistranslation. Uh, and well, Christian cultures have to deal with it. Um, and the surprising thing is, even though the Jewish Bible, the original version of the Torah, which is the uh, authoritative book of the Bible, um, when we are more, so to speak, permissive, we say, you shall not murder, but killing is sometimes allowed. Generally, Jewish society has been less violent. And also, generally, um, again, maybe th there have been some incidents where soldiers, of course, uh, run amok and they do what they're not supposed to, and they should be uh, you know, sentence, they should be at least uh, put on trial and so on. But we've had less cases of murder. Uh, there's less uh, um, cases of, 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 uh, of violence in Israeli society. There still is too much, right? I think people should be wary of raising a uh, hand against uh, anybody, no matter what your argument is, go to the police. That's why you have the police and you have the authorities. Um, but either way, the Torah is very clear, shall not murder, Killing is unfortunate, is regrettable. And of course, the Torah was the, was the first code uh, that was recognized by, so, by thousands and millions of people in the world that placed value on all human life, not just on wealthy, privileged, or uh, blue bloods. Okay, so these are the Ten Commandments, or as I said, the Decalogue. They're repeated twice in the Torah uh, with some variations, once in Exodus, the other time in, in Deuteronomy. The assumption is, that the reason it was repeated is because we know the first tablets, the first stone tablets that the, first, that the Decalogue were, were written on were, were smashed by Moses, by Moshe Rabbeinu, when he came down from the mountain and he saw the golden calf that the ancestors, our ancestors, had, had created. Um, and they were smashed and the people repented, Moses prayed for them, and then he was invited back up to the mountain and received a second set of, uh, of tablets. And we assume that What's in Exodus was on the first tablets, the first set of tablets, first pair, and what's in Deuteronomy was written on the second pair with slight variations. Uh, the variations were by God. Um, so let's get back now to Rabbi Sharkey's book. Any questions or comments? John, Daniel, Frank, everything's okay? All right, let's get back to it. 
Uh, Jeff, Jeff had a question, Rev. We can, we can get it at the end if you want to wait. No, let's. Is it, if it's relevant, no, let's. I think it makes it more sure. alive. Makes it more relevant. Sure. Uh, Jeff, go ahead if you want to. If you want to go ahead and ask. Yes. Yeah, so, <clears throat> can you guys hear me? Sure. Yeah. Really. Loud and clear. Okay. Yeah, Rabbi. So my question there would be uh, in regards to killing versus murder. What um, What if it's not a, what if you're part of a military that's not, if you're just a you know, soldier, uh, not in control of the war, but if you're just a soldier in your country's military and that war they're taking part in is not what you would consider a just war, at meaning not a defensive war and uh, can be construed as either an aggressive war or somewhat unjustified. And I think that's a, uh, uh, one that, you know, a lot of soldiers today could, in different parts of the world may may find themselves in? That's an excellent question. Um, you know, what's going on now in Russia and Ukraine, um, I would say more on the Russian side, what happens if a, a moral Russian soldier uh, who senses that this is an unfair, unjust war, uh, which I assume is what most people who are listening now would feel, um, even if you have grievances, um, but you basically invaded the whole country and you're killing many thousands of civilians and your own soldiers are being killed. So that would be a good question. Uh, obviously a soldier is expected to, um, is expected, he ha has to, an army can't function unless soldiers obey orders. Um, so I would say pretty strict obedience and uh, of, of the commands of your superior officers or your staff sergeants or whatever have to be adhered to um, because armies just wouldn't function. So I would say, and it, it's an excellent question, Jeff. And uh, this is a question, this is also why war is so terrible. Um, you know, people make bad mistakes. We're talking about leaders, the generals, the political leaders. But um, in general, if you're following orders and you're fighting an enemy that has that is armed themselves, I'm not talking about killing civilians. So the distinction would be if your commanding officer tells you uh, there is enemy over there, they're armed, they haven't raised their arms in, you know, in submission, they're not surrendering. And we have to take their uh, their position, even if you don't agree with the war. Your country has decided to go to war. Your country and your soldiers, your fellow uh, com you know uh, comrades, are in danger. And I would say also anybody that served in the military knows that you know there was that series uh, band of brothers. Anybody that served in a combat unit and has been to combat knows they are your brothers. These are the men, sometimes women, that you're going to have to rely on, and you hope and pray and expect them, you demand it of them, they have to have your back. Um, so, you know, opting out, no, this isn't a war I believe in. Well, if you can get out of it, get out of the army, that's one thing. But if you're in the army and they have weapons, the enemy has weapons, well, they're going to shoot at you, even if the war is unjust. So you don't have much of a choice. On the other hand, what happens if your commanding officer, uh, again, gives you a, an, a, an order and says there are civilians over there, they're anyway, they're the enemy, um, you have to kill them. Well, that's probably, and I think even by world or the Geneva Convention or whatever uh, sort of tries to um, guide what the, the guidelines or the, the, the rule book of, of war, uh, that would be unlawful, illegal, and immoral. I know that the Israeli military has to deal with these things. You know, we have our own code. Um, and again, we are, it's drummed into us basic training and we get refresher courses that there is such a thing as an unlawful, um, order, even from a superior officer. And not only, uh, you know, some unlawful orders, you're supposed to do what you were asked and then complain afterwards. Uh, but if it's an immoral against a crime against humanity, you are um, not allowed by military code. You are not allowed to obey that order. And you, are ha you have to refuse the order. And you can be put on trial and you can't get away with saying, well, I was given the order. And of course, this was also um, uh, uh, post World War II, post the Holocaust, when many of the Nazis who had murdered Jews, prisoners of war, and also you could say the Japanese, right? The American people have a long, uh, we still have a memory of what the, the terrible treatment that the American soldiers that, who were captured by the, by the Japanese in the, in the East, in the, in the, in the Far East, uh, they were treated terribly by their uh, Japanese captors. Now, of course, there's friendship, at least there's, uh, but uh, there's still a generation out there. There's still some people that remember it. But um, they claimed they were obeying orders. And how could you put me on trial 
I was a soldier. This is what the Nazis claimed. They were put on trial and they claimed we received orders. You don't expect us to disobey orders of our, of our commanding officers. And so Israel, and this was the, the, the League of Nations and the, uh, the allies who put them on trial said, uh, and it basically in Israel, so they said, based on that, there has to be a point where a soldier not only is allowed to, but he must refuse an order. If you're told to murder, and this would be murder, murder civilians, whether they're of this race, that race, the, the enemy, whatever they are, um, traitors, you are not allowed to do, obey that order. You must refuse the order. So, uh, Jeff, it's a complicated question, but I think that uh, if, you're, if you're in the army, your country has gone to war, uh, it's obvious that the world can't work or armies can't work if every soldier is going to decide on their own when yes and when no, as long as it's not an immoral uh, you know, uh, um, order, because they are the enemy and they are bearing weapons, then you have to protect yourself and your, your brothers in arms and your country, uh, sadly. Um, and again, the United States, of course, needs to defend itself. And not only that, even though um, it was in the Declaration of Independence, correct me, somebody, if I'm wrong, about it was very clear that the, the 13 colonies, um, when they were breaking away from Great Britain or probably England, as it was called then, uh, they made, a very made it very clear they don't want to get involved in foreign wars, right? And Europe has been at war for a thousand years, 2000 years, right? They've been going at war at each other. Uh, World War I, World War II were just, you know, they, they banned it, and it was, you know, horrible because the, uh, the, the weapons at their disposal were, were, at disposal were already, uh, you know, atrocious and, and horrendous and so on. But the, the you know, the American colonies, um, when they declared independence, they wanted to stay away from that, which was why uh, the American, you know, the United States stayed out of World War I nearly till the end, or at least till the last year. And even World War II, you know, Roosevelt tried to keep them out of the, try to keep uh, the American people or the American army uh, and Air Force and Armed Forces out of the war, even though they knew the Nazis were horrible. And, and you know, most of the people um, were sided with, the, with uh, France and with uh, England and not with Germany, Austria, Italy, and, uh, and Japan. And the big turning point, of course, when, when Japan surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, and a few, a few thousand Americans were, were killed there. And even though the, Ameri you know, the United States was negotiating, I don't have to teach you guys history, American history, but we're negotiating. There were Japanese negotiators in Washington trying to negotiate access to oil, petroleum, coal, and whatever else they wanted there, the American, uh, that the United States control. And once they attacked, of course, Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt declared war, you know, Japanese had declared war on the United States. Roosevelt declared war on Japan, and then Germany declared war on the United States because Japan, Japan was their ally, and then the United States got involved. But uh, the reason it's ironic, because now the world pretty much sees the United States as the policeman of the world. And I think it's ironic because it's, it's unfair, because on one hand, when it suits them, they call on, you know, the greatest power in the world that the world has ever seen. And when it doesn't suit them, they claim the American, you know, the United States is throwing around their weight. My feeling, again, as an American, at least, you know, I'm still having my American citizenship and I'm proud of it. You know, you can't have it both ways. Personally, I think the United States, don't risk your boys' lives unless it's, you really feel it's necessary. You know, on the other hand, there are moral issues. Let's say Ukraine now, what was going on in Serbia and in Bosnia, what is it, 20, 30 years ago, in Rwanda, um, where I visited a few years back, the atrocity that took place there in a few months, or a Holocaust took place there. But so it's a question that every country really has to deal with and every moral feeling person. When should we risk our own lives to defend people across the globe? Sorry if I gave you such a long answer, Jeff, but it is a complicated, but I think a soldier doesn't have that liberty, even morally, to decide, well, you know, I don't agree with this president. He's sending us to, uh, you know, to, to Rwanda or wherever it was, where was, um, you know, the Somalia or whatever. I don't want to go. I'm if you're, you've enlisted or you've been conscripted in the army, you don't have much of a choice. And again, as long as you're shooting people that are carrying weapons, then it's not at least immoral. It just might be very unfortunate. Okay, um, so let's move on. I'll go back uh, to now. The one, other, one other question. Daniel, do oh, you sure. have a question there before he, you left? No, no, it's okay. Uh, I just listened, uh, so it's okay for now. Thank okay. You. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, uh, Randy, go ahead. Okay, back to Bridge Shalom. 
Okay, about human life, Rabbi Akiva, famous rabbi from the times of the Romans, it was post Bar Kokhba rebellion, if you know what that is, I won't go into it now. He was eventually tortured and put to death by the Romans. Um, he was con he's considered one of the all time great rabbis. He grew up in a very poor environment. He was very, very for poor family. Um, he was considered very pious. And um, at one point, there's a story about him. Um, his, he, he was an ignoramus when it came to, he was, uh, as most people then, but there were many Jews because he had to learn some Torah, but he was, he, he knew nothing from nothing, couldn't even read or write. When he got married to a, a, a woman, um, his, his beloved uh, Rachel, um, from, uh, from a very wealthy family, a Jerusalemite family, um, he realized he wanted to study Torah, but how could he leave his wife? In order to study Torah, he had to go up, go up to Jerusalem and study there. She, she, she pushed him to go study Torah. He became one of the great sages of all time. And when he was returning to his home, according to the, the legend, as it's told, there might be embellishments, he returned with thousands, thousands of disciples. And you can imagine like almost a procession, an army, but, of, but not of soldiers, but of, of scholars of Torah. And his, the neighbors, their neighbors, he hadn't seen his wife in years. It's not like today you'd get on a bus or, you know, get on a, a train and, or a plane and, and, and come home every few days or every week or every day. He's coming home after a few years of continuous study. He's surrounded by thousands. The neighbors of, it, of their neighbors, they, she, her friends of Rachel, tell her, your husband's coming home. And she didn't have, she was, they were poor. She barely, even though she had grown up in a very wealthy home, um, they said to her, you know what, you should borrow a dress from someone, uh, you know, something becoming because your, your husband is such a great man now. And she answered, my husband knows exactly who I am. He is not impressed. She trusted in his judgment and in the love between them and the respect between them. And she doesn't borrow any dresses. She goes out. And when she sees him, she rushes for to hug him, embrace him or whatever. And some of the disciples are, of course, astounded, um, uh, disgusted. How is this woman touching this great rabbi, this saintly rabbi? And when they're about to sort of, you know, disengage her arm, she must have been holding, holding him or whatever. He says, leave her alone. All the Torah that I've learned and that I've taught you, all the knowledge that I've learned is hers. It's in her merit because she allowed me, she pushed me and allowed me to go study. So he's a great rabbi. And he says, a human being, and he's talking about all human beings, not only Jews, not only Noahides, all human beings are precious. Their lives are precious, are valuable, since God, since every human being is created in the image of the created, the image of God. Rabbi Akiva said, and I mentioned this, I think, last time or two weeks ago, um, love your neighbor as yourself. Right. Rabbi Akiva said this is a great principle. And if you know this verse, I think it's from chapter nine, Levit Leviticus, um, the conclusion of this verse is I am Hashem. I'm the Lord, your God. Love your neighbor as yourself or your fellow man as yourself. I am your God. Now, they ask why Rabbi Akiva brings this, because what, why does that need to be added? If this is a commandment. And again, I mentioned that, um, you know, you ask a Christian who said this. Who said, love your neighbor as yourself? Most of them will answer, Jesus said it. So when I hear a Christian say, I said, of course, Jesus said he was a Jewish boy. He learned this. This is something that every Jewish child learns. It's a very simple thing to understand and so difficult to implement. To really, I'm going to love my fellow man as I love myself. My fellow man's annoying. He's a nutnik, as we call him. He's, he drives me insane. Of course, but yes, but you have to try. And this begins at home. Love your wife, your spouse as yourself, let alone your children, but starts at home. Of course, you have to love yourself, not too much. You have to cherish yourself. You are valued. You are loved by God. But Rabbi Akiva is saying you shall love your fellows yourself. I am the Lord, your God. Hashem is saying, why do you have to love your fellow, your fellow man or woman? Because they are also created in the image of God. If you hurt them emotionally or physically, you are basically committing a crime against God. Again, you're allowed to protect yourself. If the person is nasty or whatever, stay away from them. Um, but you have to try. And the rabbis say, this is basically an impossible commandment. So they interpret it as saying, treat them or don't do to them what you would have, what you don't like people doing to you. Um, I don't like when people scream at me. 
Um, I don't like when people call me names even today. You know, I'm 60, almost 63 years old. You know, I can deal with it. Sticks and stones, you know, but, name, but names will never. But yes, it, words can harm you. They are annoying. They can really cause you to lose your self-confidence. But Rabbi Kiva is saying you have, you, we should try. And there's a big thing about, I think, the Jewish faith. We know we cannot attain perfection. Nobody is perfect. Even Moses was not perf perfect. Um, well, again, compared to the other two monotheistic religions, who, you know, um, Islam, uh, you, you're not allowed to draw a picture of Muhammad, and Muhammad only did, everything he did was right. And you know, there were some incidents where uh, there were characters, I think it was in uh, in France or, or in Denmark or Norway, uh, some, some cartoonist made a character of Muhammad uh, with a turban that looked like a bomb, like a signifying uh, Islamist suicide bombers. And they all, I think they almost burned down the, uh, the, 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 the printing press. Um, so what, they've turned Muhammad into something, you know, uh, uh, there's nothing wrong with idealizing, but he's a human. And of course, Christianity took a Jewish boy and turned him into also part of the Godhead, which nobody really understands. And they'll tell you it's a mystery. And of course, that's all to us. It's also foreign. The Torah goes to such lengths, if you want, to show Moses made mistakes. Our great leaders, our great ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and their wives, they all made mistakes. They're all human beings. God doesn't expect us to be perfect. The first human being and his wife in the Garden of Eden, they made a mistake, and God forgave. God knows. Our God is our parent. God knows we're going to make mistakes. Um, so loving your fellow as yourself is nearly impossible, but we don't give up on trying. We try to be the most perfect human beings that we can through love, through respect, and through good deeds. Three, the life of the human being was given by God, and therefore no one has the authority to just say, you know, uh, I, I need, you know I'm going to take that person's life. Therefore, whoever takes someone else's life or uh, his own suicide violates a commandment of the, a commandment of the creator. Uh, suicide, as in many religions, is forbidden, um, unless it's for a great cause, a soldier that lays their lives down, or any human being that lays their lives down to save somebody else, that's not something, that's not forbidden. Um, it should be only as a, as a, in, a in, in extreme situations, but um, generally we see it as a, um, uh, when, when you hear about all these threats, that they, uh, you know, when people uh, in, in Judaism, I mentioned that there's, there are traditions that a person who has committed suicide will not be buried or mourned for as normally with the same respect and dignity. Um, but generally those are rules or laws or um, that were as deterrents in order to show people this is not your way out. We have to, of course, be aware of people around us. Uh, if they're in depression, if they're depressed, if they're sad, they're going through a hard patch, a difficult patch. Uh, some people are chronically uh, depressed. We have to look out for them. We have to take care of them because not always. Obviously, there are people that are mentally imbalanced. Sometimes it's, it's temporary. Sometimes it's not. But quite often, the person needed a friend. I think there was a survey in the, I think in the, one, I think in the New York area that um, one of the problems, uh, suicide rates go up, I think, during uh, the holiday season, the winter holiday season. And they try to figure out why. So you could say, well, people are depressed because they had such high expectations. Um, they're, they're meeting their families and their families drive them batty, right? Uh, which is very sad. It's a sad statement of modern society. Uh, it should be our greatest time that we have time to spend with our, with our family to really be committed to it. Yes, it's trying being with our children uh, instead of sending them off to school each day. But the reason, the main reason they gave for the high spike that spike in suicide is because psychologists and therapists went on, went on vacation. There was nobody to talk to. People that needed a quick fix and needed therapy, they couldn't find anybody in the city or in the, in the metro, metropolitan area. Now it's a sad, again, that's sad. We all need friends. Friends are there for support. Of course, it should be spouses. It should be our families. But that's sometimes not enough. You're supposed to be, if you, you know, the, the, the matriarch or the patriarch of the family. We need good friends. That's where also communities, and one of the things we're going to be working on this year in the, uh, the World Center for Noah, the World Noahide Center, is how to help Noahides band together, find each other, 
and form small communities. A community could be a few families that live in a certain uh, you know, driving time. Uh, and that way you have support. People that you, you know, you can say, I don't like those people. I'm going to find another community. Yes, that's also okay. Jews have lived in communities for at least a thousand years now for mutual support, protection, help in bad times, friendship, and also for who we want our children to meet and marry. Um, but that's something that we're, it's a challenge because this is something new, uh, but we're looking to find ways and find the system how to help Noahides wherever they are. And of course, the more Noahides that register with us, and sometimes we do get people that ask me, you know, I live here, I live in Oregon, I live in South Africa. Um, do you have any, do you know about any groups here so that they can join them? The only exception for um, who is legally entitled, unless in extreme situations, circumstances to, uh, to perform execution or capital punishment is a court, a legal authorized court of law. Now, um, you might have heard the Torah we believe was given by God, was dictated to God through Moses for the Jewish people to be studied, to be interpreted, and to be implemented in every generation. There are things that are in the Torah that we don't think are, are correct to do today. Uh, slavery. We don't believe slavery is a good thing. The Torah allowed it with certain regulations, laws, but today we would say slavery is wrong. Though one day we'll talk about the kind of slavery that Judaism or the Torah envisioned. Um, going to battle and massacring the whole city because they refuse to accept your, uh, to, to be under your, uh, under your supervision. Um, again, we wouldn't do that and no rabbi would say this is the right thing to do. So the Torah, if you, when you read the Bible, especially the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, you'll find, you know, it says you do this, put this person to death. They shall surely be put to death. Yeah, but again, as I mentioned, for the, the laws of suicide, those are more as deterrents. Um, for instance, the Torah says, um, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, right? You've probably all heard it in a few places. I think at least two places. The Torah says, if somebody causes bodily damage, pain and permanent damage to somebody else, what is the, what is the law? An eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. It, does it make sense or is it just? It's just. You cause damage to somebody else, we're going to punish you in the same, in the same way. The rabbis, though, explained, and we're talking about, again, the, 2,000 years ago, they said that's not what the Torah meant. Yes, God dictated to Moses, write it down, Moses, my man. An eye for an eye, a tooth for tooth. That is what is just. But a few things the rabbis say. It doesn't help the victim. The victim needs compensation. The victim needs medical, uh, has medical bills. That's more important than the vengeance of an eye for an eye. So there are, you have to pay the damages, compensation, and support, and, and loss of, of income, loss of wages. So on the other end, then, you might say, so why did the Torah write an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth? I believe it's because that is the, that's the ideal, in a, so to speak, in, a, in, in, uh, in the laboratory. Really, the, the criminal or the person who was negligent and caused this bodily damage to someone else, this uh, another human being, they should always know, no matter how much compensation you pay, you've crippled that person. So you'll never really have paid them back or compensated them. Really, what should have been done to you in court was an eye for an eye. But the Torah is merciful, and we care about the victim more than we care about punishing you. So your punishment is compensation. So that's an example that, again, going back to capital punishment. In principle, the Torah says, yes, capital punishment is permitted. However, the Torah, based on our interpretations, meant it to be more as a deterrent, as a threat. But really, uh, we're more worried about the uh, we're more worried about the victims and uh, and other things. So we we never put, at least according to our history, we never put people uh, on, only on very rare cases where criminals of any type or violators of rituals were, were put to death. It, so don't be. So if you find it written in the Pentateuch and somebody says. Well, the Old Testament talks about a God of punishment and a God of, uh, of vengeance. Uh, not true. Judaism is the religion of love. And, uh, you know, our, our basic, you know, we just mentioned before, love your neighbor as yourself. Um, you know, I recite at least twice a day, if not three times a day. I say the Shema, hear, O Israel, Adonai is our God. Adonai is one, which means and we're, we're working towards making Hashem one for all nations. And immediately after that, we say, and you shall love. 
Adonai your God with all your heart, with all your might, with all your soul. Definitely believe in love. Um, but the Torah is, 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 is admonishing. And as a deterrent, you know, you talk about love and forgiveness, but criminals, terrorists, we have to deter them. And victims, we have to worry about the victims um, uh, that, that the, the, the criminals should not go free. Let's try one more before we finish today. Number four, the prohibition of murder applies to an act committed directly or indirectly or by an agent. If you send a thug, you pay them to do that. The thug is also a criminal and should be punished. But if you did it directly means um, by a direct act or you brought it about, it still is prohibited. In other words, if it was intentional, if it wasn't intentional, well, then what can you do? You might be negligent and you have to find some way of compensating if possible. But you can't get off and say, well, I didn't do it. I sent somebody else. No, you, it still is prohibited. Even though the punishment of execution by a court is reserved for someone who murders directly, only a person who um, actually planned it out, chose their victim, and they are the direct, they, they brought about the, the loss of life. Yes, in, only in that situation, theoretically, could a court put someone to death, could put them to, to execute. However, someone who murders indirectly is still a murderer, and his sentence is determined in heaven. Now, someone who didn't do it on purpose, but by what they did, they caused it to come about. Somebody was dr a drunk driver. Now, they didn't intend to do it. And now let's make it even easier to make a distinction. A drunk driver who causes somebody else to veer and to hit a pedestrian because they were driving or somebody was driving crazily, totally over the speed limit. And they caused somebody else to run a red light or to run up on the sidewalk and so on. And that, that other person killed someone. Now, nobody intended for it to happen, but you are very negligent. You caused it indirectly. So a court's not going to execute you. Of course, every country has the right to legislate its own laws, but based on the laws of the Torah, you will be held responsible in heaven because you did bring about the loss of life by, um, by actions that were irresponsible and led about to uh, the death of somebody else. All right, I think that's enough for today. I don't want to overload everybody. Um, if, there are any other, if there aren't any other questions, uh, I'd like to thank Frank again for facilitating this, this shiur. Um, to all the Noahides listening live, or uh, we're going to look at it uh, by, uh, over the next week or two, please feel free to post any comments or any questions on the, uh, uh, on the YouTube channel that Frank has, and Frank keeps uh, functioning. Uh, God bless you all. Look for others. Spread the message of Noahides that there is an alternative out there. So I think there are many discouraged, um, whether Christians or atheists out there, that are looking for some kind of truth that gives meaning without anybody telling you what to do. I'm not telling anybody what to do. We're teachers. That's all I'm trying to do is teach. Rabbi Chaim Goldberg, who's my, you know, my mentor. I've just gotten into this organization, but I've been teaching as a rabbi for many years, different parts of the world. We're teachers. We're not looking to control anybody. So therefore, if you find, you think there's some people that are looking for some meaning, and they want to opt out, opt out of where they are now, whatever, and not to me physically, spiritually, wherever they are now. You know, you might mention that you're looking into the Noahide faith, the Noahide way. It's interesting. You're allowed to ask questions. We encourage people to ask questions. And I'm admitting right now, I don't have all the answers. Even Rav Sherke, who's a brilliant rabbi, doesn't have all the answers. Um, but we try. We put our minds together and we believe um, well-intended, well-intending human beings. That are, that are learned, that are educated, and want and, and, are, and, and have a good moral bearing, we can come up with things together to make this world a better place. So God bless you all. Frank, we'll see you next week. And uh, thanks again to Frank for facilitating this. Jeff, nice getting to talk to you. Have a good week. What's, re what's left of it, everybody? Thank you. Shalom, uh, Jerusalem. Thank you. Thank you. Shalom. Bye.